the Catholic Men's Podcast, helping you find good works of literature for the Catholic gentleman. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten diadems, and upon his heads names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his own strength and great power, and I saw one of his heads as it were slain to death, and his death's wound was healed and all the earth was in admiration after the beast. And they adored the dragon, which gave power to the beast. And they adored the beast, saying, Who is like to the beast, and who shall be able to fight with him? The Apocalypse of St. John, Chapter 13 God in his infinite wisdom has given us prefigurements of this apocalyptic monster in history. This podcast will cover three stories of saints who subdued hideous beasts in their own times through the grace of God. Story 1, St. Columba and the Loch Ness Monster by Angelo Stagnaro The big blank spaces in the map are all being filled in, and there's no room for romance anywhere. Quote from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle On August 22nd, in the year of our Lord 565, well over a thousand years ago, St. Columba had a story for the ages. For upon this fateful day he made short shrift of the legendary Loch Ness Monster. St. Columba was an Irish abbot, missionary, and scholar who helped spread Christianity in Scotland. But this is only a small part of his resume. He also founded many churches and monasteries, including the great Iona Abbey. Both Scotsmen and Irishmen alike revere his name and are eternally grateful to him for civilizing their pagan ancestors and offering them Christ's promise of salvation and eternal reward. We read about Columba's monstrous encounter in The Life of St. Columba, written by his 7th century biographer, St. Adamnan. This is also the first written account of the Loch Ness Monster. While standing upon the bank of the River Ness, which flows out of Loch Ness in northern Scotland, Columba contemplated the best way to cross to the other side. As he considered the problem before him, he came across a group of pagan Picts who were busy burying a friend who had been attacked by an enormous water beast while swimming in the river. When Columba had got the gist of the story from the assembled mourners, he laid his staff across the dead man's chest and, miraculously, the man stood up, hale and hearty. Columba then ordered Brother Loon Mokumen, one of his fellow monks, to swim across the lock and bring back a small boat known as a cobble, which was moored on the opposite shore. Without hesitation, Loon stripped off his tunic and immediately jumped into the water. The monster, alerted by loons splashing around, surfaced and raced towards the hapless monk, eager for a bite of dinner. The monster roared mightily, darting towards the swimming monk with its mouth wide open, just as Loon was coming to the middle of the stream. Everyone on the shore cried out, hoping to warn the monk of his impending doom. However, Columba was unmoved. The saint stepped forward boldly to the edge of the lock, made the sign of the cross, and invoked the name of the Lord. He ordered the monster, You will go no further. Do not touch the man. Leave at once. Even though the monster was no more than a spear's length away from the swimming monk, it stopped immediately upon the saint's command and fled the scene, terrified. As Adamnan described it, the monster moved more quickly than if it had been pulled back with ropes. The monster quickly absconded to the depths of the lock behind him, allowing Brother Loon to paddle the boat back unharmed. All were astonished. If the heathens at the funeral weren't sufficiently impressed with Columba bringing their friend back to life, they were thoroughly impressed with how the monster obeyed the saint. They all gave glory to the God of the Christians. The Picts converted on the spot, being baptized in the very waters of River Ness. But Columba's monks were probably a little surprised as well. According to St. Adamnan, the Irish monk was a veritable magician, producing hot and cold miracles as easy as turning on a faucet. 
Columba had prophesied regularly and cured the sick. Once when he didn't have wine for Mass, he miraculously changed water into wine, just as our Savior did. St. Columba also produced water from a rock, calmed storms at sea, conversed liberally with angels, subdued savage beasts like boars and serpents, provided several fishermen with a bounteous catch of fish, and brought peace to warring factions. He even exercised demons without batting an eye, and all the while a divine light seemed to follow him wherever he went. Is the story of Nessie true? That is, had an evil monster lived in a lonely Scottish lake at one time, and was it dispelled by the spiritual authority of a holy man? Why not? If this story was about a holy person exercising a powerful demon, very few Christians would deny its veracity, as in the cases of St. Anthony of Egypt, or St. Francis of Assisi struggles with such infernal creatures. There's no reason whatsoever to think that Nessie wasn't a spiritual manifestation of supreme evil, and that Columba's blessing served as an exorcism, banishing him from this plane of existence. Or maybe Nessie's still waiting at the bottom of the lock, waiting for the times of the apocalypse. Story 2. St. Romanus of Rouen and La Gargoyle. Once upon a time, in the 7th century, around the 600s, in the town of Rouen, there was a terrible dragon known as La Gargoyle. The Gargoyle was a most formidable creature with a long neck, great bat wings, and reptilian jaws that sounded like the guillotine when they snapped shut. He made his home in a cave in the wild swamps on the left bank of the River Seine. The Gargoyle could breathe fire and water, the huge serpent, or dragon, devoured and destroyed people and beasts of the field. He often torched the nearby village and caused floods. He also liked to munch on the ships that were so unlucky as to cross his path. The villagers of Rouen were so terrified by the gargoyle that they would offer him a sacrifice every year. Although the gargoyle, like most dragons, preferred young maidens, the frugal townspeople usually brought forth a convict, who was most likely sentenced to die anyway. Enter St. Romanus, who agreed to get rid of the dragon if all the townspeople would be baptized and build a church in Christ's name. The people were willing, so with a cross and the annual convict in tow, St. Romanus set out to defeat the gargoyle. Using the sign of the cross, St. Romanus was able to conquer the beast. He returned with the convict and the now docile dragon to Rouen. There, the gargoyle, although tamed, was burned at the stake. Curiously, the head and neck of the gargoyle would not burn, seeing as they had been tempered by the dragon's own fiery breath. St. Romanus then nailed the head and neck of the gargoyle upon his new church, where it became a water spout forevermore. This legend was the origin for the bishop's privilege to pardon one prisoner condemned to death each year by giving the pardoned man or woman the reliquary holding Romanus's relics in a procession. Sadly, the privilege of St. Romain was abolished during the infamous French Revolution. Story 3 how St. Francis Converted a Ravenous Wolf, performed by the cast of the TFP Tales for Young and Old. Brother Wolf At the time when St. Francis was living in the city of Gubbio, a large wolf appeared in the neighborhood, so terrible and so fierce that he not only devoured other animals, but made prey of men as well. And since he often approached the town, all the people were in great alarm and used to go about armed as if going into battle. Notwithstanding these precautions, if any of the inhabitants ever met him alone, he was sure to be devoured, as all defense was useless. And, through fear of the wolf, they dared not go beyond the city walls. St. Francis, feeling great compassion for the people of Gubbio, resolved to go and meet the wolf, though all advised him not to do so. Making the sign of the Holy Cross and putting all his confidence in God, he went forth from the city, taking his brethren with him. 
But these, fearing to go any further, St. Francis alone turned his steps towards the spot where the wolf was known to be, while many people followed at a distance. The wolf, seeing this multitude, ran towards the saint with his jaws wide open. As he approached, the saint, making the sign of the cross, cried out, Come hither, brother wolf. I command thee in the name of Christ, neither to harm me nor anybody else. Marvellous to tell, no sooner had St. Francis made the sign of the cross than the terrible wolf, closing his jaws, stopped running, and coming up to St. Francis, lay down at his feet, as meekly as a lamb. Then the saint addressed him, saying, Brother Wolf, you have done much evil in this land, destroying and killing the creatures of God without permission. Yea, not animals only have you destroyed, but you have even dared to devour men made after the image of God, for which thing you are worthy of being hanged like a robber and a murderer. All men cry out against you. The dogs pursue you, and all the inhabitants of this city are your enemies. But I will make peace between them and you, O oh brother wolf. If you no more offend them, they shall forgive you all your past offenses, and neither men nor dogs shall pursue you any more. Having listened to these words, the wolf bowed his head, and by the movements of his body, his tail and his eyes, indicated that he agreed to do what St. Francis had said. At this, Francis confirmed, As you are willing to make this peace, I promise you that you shall be fed every day by the inhabitants of this land so long as you shall live among them. You shall no longer suffer hunger, as it is hunger which has made you do so much evil. But if I obtain all this for you, you must promise on your part never again to attack any animal or any human being. Do you make this promise? Then the wolf, bowing his head, made a sign that he consented. St. Francis continued, Brother Wolf, will you pledge your faith that I may trust in this your promise? Putting out his hand, he received the pledge of the wolf, for the latter lifted up his paw and placed it familiarly in the hand of Francis, giving him thereby the only pledge which was in his power. Then said St. Francis, addressing him again, Brother Wolf, I command you in the name of Christ to follow me immediately, without hesitation or doubting, that we may go together to ratify this peace which we have concluded in the name of God. And the wolf, obeying him, walked by his side as meekly as a lamb, to the great astonishment of all the people. Now, the news of this most wonderful miracle spread quickly through the town, so all the inhabitants, both men and women, small and great, young and old, flocked to the marketplace to see St. Francis and the wolf. All the people being assembled, the saint got up to preach, saying, amongst other things, how for our sins God permits such calamities, and how much greater and more dangerous are the flames of hell which last forever, and the rage of a wolf, which can kill the body only. And how much we ought to dread the jaws of hell, if the jaws of so small an animal as a wolf can make a whole city tremble through fear. The sermon being ended, St. Francis added these words. Listen, my brethren. The wolf who is here before you has promised and pledged his faith that he consents to make peace with you all and no more offend you, and you must promise to give him each day his necessary food. 
to which, if you consent, I promise in his name that he will most faithfully observe the contract. Then all the people promised with one voice to feed the wolf to the end of his days. And St. Francis, addressing the latter, said again, And you, brother wolf, do you promise to keep the contract and never again to offend either man or beast or any other creature? And the wolf knelt down, bowing his head, and by the motions of his tail and ears, endeavoured to show that he was willing, as far as was in his power, to hold the contract. Francis continued, Brother Wolf, as you gave me a pledge of this your promise when we were outside the town, so now I will that you renew it in the sight of all this people, and assure me that I have done well to promise in your name. And the wolf, lifting up his paw, placed it in St. Francis' hand. Now, this event caused great joy in all the people, and a great devotion towards St. Francis, both because of the novelty of the miracle, and because of the peace which had been concluded with the wolf. And they lifted up their voices to heaven, praising and blessing God, who had sent them St. Francis, through whose merits they had been delivered from such a savage beast. The wolf lived two years in Gubbio. He went in a friendly manner from door to door, without harming anyone. And all the people received him courteously, feeding him with great pleasure. And no dog barked at him as he went about. At last, after two years, the wolf died of old age, and the people of Gubbio mourned his loss greatly. For when they saw him going about so gently amongst them, he reminded them of the virtue and the sanctity of St. Francis. Retold from an account of Thomas Seleno, in Treatise on the Miracles of Blessed Francis. I hope you enjoyed these inspiring stories, and please keep an eye out for more of my podcast this week because I'm going to try to upload more often. Thanks for listening, and Godspeed.